I'm Dr. Michael Gruden. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on Duovat, a new biomimetic aortic transcatheteric valve. We're going to look at the early feasibility and safety of this really unique valve. I'm joined today by a great panel. To my left is Becky Hahn, then Chris Maduri, and Azim Latib. Uh, Chris is a, the uh, chief medical officer for the company. And Chris, you're going to start us off and tell us a little bit about this valve. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Mike, and uh, great to be here amongst friends. Uh, exciting times here at TCT. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as we look at this, the field of taverns, some exciting, you know, stuff coming out in the next few days, um, we really uh, think with this Duravar that really this is not just the same old valve that we've seen uh, on a catheter that has been done, you know, in several different f forms and iterations with other companies, but this is really another class of tavern, not mechanical, not bioprosthetic. This is a single pace, native shaped biomimetic valve. And it's really been designed uniquely to mimic the performance of a healthy aortic valve. And the reason is instead of using a traditional single piece of bovine barrier tissue that's then cut into three pieces and then sutured with 800 sutures to actually form a valve, this valve's tissue is actually molded to mimic the native valve. And I think as we'll see with some of the data we see later, there's really unique properties by doing something that is much more biomimetic, native-like, mimicking the native valve. Additionally, this valve is a bit different is because the tissue itself is not just one, some new tissue. It actually uses the ADAPT anti-calcification technology that's been used in over 55,000 patients worldwide. It is a balloon expandable platform, so you have that very nice precision deployment with a very easy to use device. Uh, we have a feature for commissure alignment on there that makes it quite easy to align the commissures. And really, the design of the stent frame was really to put the lifetime management in mind for our patients. We want to have things that facilitate ease of coronary access and other things like that. Now, when you see now the images in front of you now where you look at this, the comparison of this valve compared to other valve technologies on the hydrodynamic testing, and this testing was done by Janar Santhanathan last year, what you can see is actually, when you compare this unique biomimetic valve design compared to competitor valves such as Evolute and Sapien, you can see that because of this unique design, there's a significantly better hemodynamic performance compared to the competitors. And this, as you can appreciate from the images here, is because this design allows you to have a much larger opening area and a much more native-like opening of the valve. You know, Chris, it's interesting, as a surgeon that's been doing valves for 40 years, my patients really want tissue valves. But the big issue has always been durability. Yeah. And, and this valve design and the tissue science behind it really is, a surgeon, something very exciting to me, not only for good short-term, but really long-term use. So it, uh, I think it's going to be great to hear about what we found in our early trial. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. So, you know, we started and completed the EFS uh, here in the United States. The EFS is a prospective, non-randomized, 15-patient study in seven centers. And really, it was trying to understand the feasibility and safety of using this novel platform. So we treated 15 patients, all high risk, with severe AS. Uh, what's interesting is also the follow-up in this. All these patients, all the imaging will be evaluated by Core Lab. So the data will show you our core lab data. We're also going to be trying to get some CMR in, in these patients because I think there's some really interesting effects of having a, nate, a biomimetic valve, as, as Chris called it, as regards to hemodynamics. Uh, we had a central screening committee as is standard and an external events committee. So what's been good so far, we just finished the study. In the first 15 patients, there have been no deaths, no periprocedural strokes, no pa permanent pacemakers, mm -hmm. no vascular complications or major bleeding or any reinterventions. Here you see one of the implants that we did. This is a balloon expandable valve, so very predictable deployment. Um, you can see the, 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 really the stent design with these large open cells on top. And you get a sense also of the markers we use for commercial alignment. So all 15 cases were successfully implanted. We really had none or trace PVL in 93% of patients. And so very good results um, and no issues during the procedure. Here you see an example of an aortogram and really no PVL in, like I said, majority of patients. So maybe Becky, you can take us through the hemodynamics. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting valve. Um, when you look at the CTs uh, pre-procedurally, it turns out that the patients in the trial had a, a mean 
a area, a annual area of 389 plus or minus 29. So if you look at the um, normative data that we have for the balloon expan currently available commercial balloon expandable valve, um, and this is all from Core Lab, that's where the patients that that were uh, done in the early feasibility fall. So they're 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 small annuli, and so the expected valve area uh, for a, the current iteration again of a commercially available balloon expandable valve is 1.58 centimeters squared plus or minus 0.33 uh, with a DVI, um, so Doppler index of 0.44. If you go to the next slide, you'll see what we found in, on discharge echo for those 15 patients. The effective orifice area, again, standard continuity equation was 2.36. I mean, it just incredibly larger than the expected valve area for what we've seen uh, to date. And the mean gradients are below 10, so not, not close to, to double digits. So this was a 7.8 millimeter mercury mean gradient. And then some of the highest DIs that we've seen, yeah. even for surgical valves yeah. as we were discussing, 0.71, just an incredibly uh, beautiful hemodynamics that really mimic a normal valve. Well, I'll tell you, again, as a surgeon, we've known for decades that the bigger EOA you start with, the longer your valve is gonna last, the better you're gonna do both short term and long term. And Corlin showed us back in the 50s when he was working out flow across fixed orifices, until you got to an EOA of two, you couldn't really increase your flow without increasing your gradient. So not only will this be a great valve for older people, but for younger people that want to stay active, uh, this is gonna be a great valve. Because once you get above two, and this is substantially above two, uh, this is really gonna be a, a good valve for active people uh, and, and good short term, long term. Uh, I'm very excited as a surgeon about this. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting also just the uh, molded uh, leaflet um, because not only I think we've learned that commissural alignment becomes very important also for durability, but it becomes important for washout of the sinuses. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's yeah. meant to be yeah. in a certain yeah. position. God because, gave us sinuses for a reason. Exactly, and the aorta is shaped a certain way that the washout yeah. uh, needs to have that commissural alignment. and so. It's, it's really a beautifully designed valve. Well, yeah, it's interesting when you think about lifetime management, because we are moving as a field to younger and younger patients, mm -hmm. and we're generating the data that we need, and we talk about lifetime management, we always talk about, let's find the valve that's gonna last a long time, let's find the valve that's gonna give you optimal hemodynamics, let's find a valve that's not gonna cause pacemakers, and gonna let you get back in the coronaries, and oh, by the way, if it fails, it's gonna be a good platform for the next valve. If you look at this valve, it ticks every one of those boxes. It's really quite exciting. Yep. No, I think you're exactly right, guys. I, um, I think it's really exciting. I think, you know, as we alluded to, I think that these hemodynamics are, are unparalleled, uh, you know, as we talked about, Becky. Um, you know, I think there's other exciting things as well. You know, we've looked at, as Azim alluded to earlier, this biomimetic valve frame not only allows us to have this acute improvement in flow from a classic hemodynamic performance, but also we've seen on cardiac MRI data now, normalization mm -hmm. of laminar flow out of the aorta. And I think, you know, that's also something that's likely to have significant implications if we think about the long-term durability of valves, stress on the leaflets, but also aortopathies, potentially inflammation, other things as well. And then additionally, on the hydrodynamic testing, and Becky, you've been there and seen some of these TE images, what we see that we don't see in other valve is because that coaptation length is so long on this valve, it really prevents the valve from pinwheeling. And I think we're gonna probably learn more from some of these other studies that are coming out of other things, that durability is a huge impact and how you put that valve in and how it functions immediately afterwards is it can impact that durability. And Becky, you saw in T and you can comment to this, we don't see pinwheeling with this valve compared to others. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, again, because of its it, it's kind of shaped, right? The leaflets are actually it's a single leaflet, and it, they're shaped uh, on closure. It's a very smooth coaptation line all along the the comma shores. Um, but in addition, what we've also seen is that when the leaflets open, despite these really long leaflets, when the leaflets open, we don't see a whole lot of fluttering. There's not a mm -hmm. lot of excess leaflet. Mm -hmm. Um, which will end up, if the fluttering will end up causing a lot of stress on the leaflets. Mm -hmm. Again, um, really probably affecting durability. And so uh, we really think that this is, this is a very unique uh, valve design. Absolutely. Another thing that we've learned, Chris, from, mitro, from aortic valve repair, since we're doing more of those, is that the more overlap you have, the longer the repairs last. 
Mm. And it's really interesting to look at that co-optation. It's much like mitral valve repair. In fact, I'll tell you, yeah. if you don't get co if you don't get overlap in your mitral valve repair, it will come back. And we do aortic valve repair, same thing. We want to see it look like a pair of praying hands, but at least about eight millimeters of overlap. This valve gives us that. It gives us, you know, the at least the feel is a surge and it's done a lot of repairs. This is something that's going to be very durable. Absolutely. Yeah, I think also, you know, we all want our patients to leave the hospital with the lowest possible gradients and the largest possible air, valve area, right? And I think as we go to younger and younger patients, being able to ensure that's really important. But Chris, I did have a question for you. I mean, these, we're showing your discharge data. Do we have any data, longer term data on these patients? We do actually. Um, you know, we've now, and Nazim and Becky have been there for some of these uh, first in human cases before we start the early feasibility study, but it's been very encouraging, I think, to date now. We've treated 20 patients OUS, um, and we have now 12 out to one year. And what we see is consistency in our effective orifice area. Uh, our mean gradients remain consistent. And, you know, I think, you know, it's an encouraging signal because we've seen in some, actually, TAVR studies that decline in these things already within the first year. And so uh, I think that, you know, this valve was not just built to provide the immediate short-term result, which I think really stands apart from the technologies that it, it, uh, are offered today, but also was built to really provide the longest-term result for our patients as well. And I think, again, as you've alluded to, I mean, you know, right now we're kind of in a conundrum of trade-offs when we talk about how we offer uh, technologies to our patients. Are they young or old and should we offer better hemodynamics or a shorter frame? And I think, you know, with the consistency of the longer term hemodynamics, with the cons the great acute results, this really has the ability to potentially um, shift the paradigm from taking away trade-offs to actually having a single solution for all patients. Well, I tell you, the thing that really impresses me, when the surgeon tells you the valve looks good, that's okay. The cardiologist tells it looks okay. But when the imager tells you it looks good, you have a good valve. Becky is the gold standard. The imagers count. Becky is the gold standard. We can make sure. Becky happy with this valve. We've done our job. Exactly, exactly. Well, listen, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. I think this is a very exciting new valve as we move the field forward. Uh, this is really a new class of TAVR. It shows outstanding hemodynamic performance. Delivery system is very intuitive and easy to use, even for our first time users. The results really demonstrate an excellent safety profile. You saw what Dr. Latib showed you, and the 30 day EFS results are going to be presented at London Valves as a late breaking clinical trial session, but they are first in class. Thank you very much for joining us.